Well, hello there. Welcome to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the complete history of the Asia-Pacific War from 1937 to 1945. <laughs> This is another historical film review, and it will be on The Warlords, directed and produced by Peter Chan, starring Jet Li, Andy Lau, Takashi Kaneshiro, and Zhu Jingli. Please note this film is actually loosely a remake of another film that was made in 1973 called Blood Brothers. Now if you've not already done so, please leave a like, subscribe, and comment below. And a uh, Another note, this is a historic film review, so there is going to be spoilers. You have now been warned. I want to take a moment before to mention, for those of you that know nothing about the Taiping Rebellion of 1850 to 1871, this film might be a little bit confusing. I happen to have an entire episode on the Taiping Rebellion, so if you'd like, you can click on the card above, and you can get all the details on the entire thing there. Now, this film is not about the Taiping Rebellion per se, it just happens to take place during the event. The film is really about two things, an epic story from the 1973 film Blood Brothers, and the real life story of Mao Xinyi, who was involved in the Taiping Rebellion. To explain this more for Western audiences, imagine a Greek epic tragedy story about characters who just happen to be involved in World War II. The movie is not about World War II, but it's in the background. That's a way to look at this. With all that being said, I will try to brutally summarize the Taiping Rebellion just to give you some background information. The Taiping Rebellion occurred from 1850 to 1871 in China and was largely a religious and social class struggle against the corrupt Qing dynasty. The Taiping rebels were extremely successful early on until they captured the great city of Nanjing, whereupon they got a bit soft and eventually crumbled to Qing forces. This was no small rebellion. The Qing dynasty could have been overthrown by these rebels. Over 20 to 30 million people are believed to have died during this total war, with some districts losing 40 to 80 percent of their population. This was the bloodiest conflict in world history until World War II. Please let that sink in. What makes the film a bit confusing is a number of different armies involved with the real history. The director, however, seems to have gone through great lengths to be ambiguous about which army is part of what faction in this film. Historically, we have the Taiping rebels, who fought the Qing dynasty forces. The Qing dynasty's forces consisted of two imperial standing armies, the Eight Banners Army and the Green Standard Army, and an assortment of regional militia armies such as Zhang Army, the Hui Army, and the Chu Army. In the film, however, all armies are called ambiguous names, and you do not really have any idea who is who. But I will do my best to explain who the armies are supposedly there to represent historically. Our film starts off with Taiping rebels brutally massacring a smaller Qing Green Standard Army force. Then the camera pans over a devastated mass of corpses to show a single survivor, that being Pang Qingyun, played by Jet Li. Pang Qingyun is based off of the real Ma Xinyi, a Hui Muslim and native of Heze Shangdong. He was a general for the Green Standard Army fighting against the Taiping rebels, historically. Pang pretended to be dead in order to survive the massacre that took the lives of everyone under his command. It is made clear during the movie that his forces were betrayed and abandoned by an ally named General Ho, who controlled the ambiguously named Kui Army. I believe the Kui army he is referring to historically is the Zhang army or perhaps the Hui army. The difference between Pang's force and Ho's is Pang is a regular imperial military unit of the Green Standard Army of the Qing Dynasty, whereas the Zhang army was a regional militia force raised by a local warlord, basically. Anyways, Pang feels extreme guilt for surviving while all of his comrades died and ends up in the care of a woman named Liang Xiang, played by Zhu Jinglei, who nurses him back to health. 
They become romantically involved over a period of time, you get where that's going, and she simply runs off and disappears, leaving Pang alone. So Pang goes off into the local village where we see some many poor and starving villagers. It's very important to note the use of desaturated color for all scenes involving the common people in this film. The depiction of the common people is so well done and appropriate for the time period. Everyone is depicted very weary of war and starving. You can really feel the unrest by just looking at them. Lack of food and hunger is a constant theme in this film, and that is for a very good reason, as starvation was rampant during the Taiping Rebellion. There is very little hope or happiness to be seen anywhere, because let's remember, this is a total war situation. China is utterly devastated by the rebellion, and everyone is afflicted by it. We soon see a local bandit group walk through the village, handing out food in order to recruit men to join an upcoming raid. One of the bandits sees Pang and his military boots and attacks him to try and steal them. Pang ends up defeating the bandit in martial art combat and the man smiles, saying that he's a good fighter and that he shall in introduce him to his big brother. This man's name is Zhang Wu Yang, played by Takashi Kenishiro. We now see the bandit group that Pang has joined up with is going to attack and rob a Taiping Rebellion convoy. The leader of the bandit group is named Zhuo Yu, played by Andy Lau. The bandits surprise attack the Taiping's convoy, and Pang eventually joins in the battle. The battle is very well done and shows the gritty melee combat of the era. And, well, you know, Jet Li just destroys eight guys single handed by himself, but hell, you know, it's Jet Li. I also find it really showcases the time period, as during the later years of the Taiping Rebellion, the peasantry class became so fed up with both sides of the conflict, they resorted to banditry quite often, and this little convoy attack really embodies the hunger and anger of the peasants. Uh, Pang ends up saving both Jiang and, oh my god, ouch to holding that sword blade, and Eryu during combat showcasing himself to be a great warrior and hero. Here's a special note. If you listen clearly to some of the songs, you're going to notice something. Now, where have I heard this one from? Original composition says so on the soundtrack. Well, anyways, we shall carry on. The bandits return to the village celebrating and handing out food to the hungry masses. There it is always a general feeling of hunger and desperation during this entire film. The director really wants the audience to be in the mindset of what the people are going through during this time period. Pang then sees his long lost honey, Yang Zheng, but she has a husband and it's the bandit leader, Zhao Eryu. A focal point of the plot is introduced here as this is indeed a story of romance, brotherhood, and betrayal. Honestly, it's your standard Greek tragedy if you think about it. We get a short scene where Eryu gives Liang Sheng a cross which he took off a fallen Taiping soldier. Eryu does not seem to understand what it is and Liang Sheng tells him it protects you when you wear it. A cheeky short scene depicting the Christian influence behind the Taiping rebels cause. You see, the Taiping Rebellion was basically a proto-Protestant group. The film constantly shows symbolic instances without dwelling too much into it. Everyone is eating cheerfully, while Eryu has a short conversation with Pang about his background. It is during this scene we get the first glimmer of the importance of brotherhood. Suddenly, the village is being ransacked by the Kui army, the same army that abandoned Pang. The Kui army have shown to be a clear upper hand here, having a lot of matchlock muskets, and the bandits are forced to give up the goods they stole to the Kui army, who smugly just walk off with it. Now, Pang speaks to the bandits and tells them that the Kui army is much stronger than them, and if they want to improve their situation, they should join the Imperial army. In other words, you will get wages and guns, and no one will be able to bully you, and the village will finally have peace. This is very important, as the idea of not allowing people to bully you is actually intrinsic to Pang's character. He is trying to convey a sense of right and wrong, which he will expand upon later in the film. Pang says that they should join Lord Chan's army, which I believe is referring to the historic Green Standard Army. Remember, the Kui army, which is probably the Jiang army, is not a standard army unit under the Qing dynasty. These forces were more of a last-ditch effort to raise militias to fight the Taiping. The Hui, Jiang, and Chu 
militias were somewhat of a threat to the Qing dynasty as they were basically run by local warlords who would perhaps overthrow the Qing dynasty later. Eryu's brother, Yang, tells him in order to trust Pang, they should do a blood oath. A scene proceeds with some unfortunate Taiping rebels who are executed during this bloody oath by the three men, and uh, from then on, uh, they declare themselves blood brothers. The trio go to Lord Chan of the Green Standard Army. Lord Chan tells Pang that he lost his entire battalion and went missing for two months, and how dare he return? Pang says that he was betrayed by the Kui army, whom sat idly as Pang's forces were massacred. Pang then demands imperial soldiers and declares he will capture Xi City within 10 days. Lord Chan agrees, but holds little hope in this matter. The bandits and the imperial soldiers join together, but there are quite a few problems. The imperial soldiers do not want to take any risks, as they have very few guns, while the enemy will have over 200. The odds are not in their favor, to say the least, and Pang says in order to win, they must attack head-on and force melee combat. Peng also tells the bandits that they're the ones that must run in front with the shields so that the archers can get in range to fire at the enemy, which means a lot of the bandits are going to die. The battle is pretty impressive, I must say. It gives you a real sense of how battles were fought in this time period. I also want to point out that historically, archers of the Eight Bannermen and the Green Standard Army, uh, to a lesser extent, turned the tide of the war. The Taiping rebels came mostly from southern China, which really didn't specialize in archery, unlike the north and thus the Qing forces had one advantage there. It is somewhat showcased with the archers in this battle. The Green Standard forces managed to get into melee range and the combat, but the situation is dire as the new soldiers added to them are not engaging. They're still in the back, fearing the risk. Erhu leads a cavalry charge, and I uh, gotta say in this film, a lot of poor horses are gonna be tripped. This is not CGI people. Those are animals pretty much being abused in this film. So, animal lovers beware. Pang attacks the Taiping artillery position in a desperate move to push the Imperial soldiers to join the bandits in the fight, and holy shit, he gets impaled and then just keeps going. Jet leave, everybody. So anyways, it finally works. The entire Green Standard Army now engages and wipes out the Taiping rebels. The battle ends with Yang holding the head of the enemy Taiping commander and screaming. Lord Chen is so impressed, he offers Pang another five battalions. But he also states that Pang's old friend, He Kui, the commander of the Kui army, is here. And then he states that He Kui's forces will back up Pang's, which is obviously not what Pang wants. Pang throws an insult at He Kui and then states his army will take Su Zhuo, and then after the capital of the Taiping rebels, Nanjing. Pang's forces come back to the village victorious, showcasing their spoils. We also get an attempt by Pang to see Liang Sheng again, but she does not come. Pang still loves her and seeks her out, even though she is the wife of his blood brother, Yu. We then get some scenes of Pang's forces capturing cities and pillaging them, and they are becoming a strong military force. However, two men under Pang decide to rape some women during the pillaging, and Pang intends to execute them for this crime. The two other brothers beg Pang not to kill them, and this is where we get an important look at Pang's character. Pang states, that he was a civil servant in the past and he saw soldiers beating a peasant bloody on the streets for no reason other than the fact that the peasant was poor. After seeing this, Pang promised himself that he would never let someone be bullied like that again. He says that men and women alike should be freed from oppression and that is what they are fighting for. Pang's dream is a more equalized society where there will be no more oppression and only justice. Now, I'm just going to say it right here. If anybody was fighting for the common rights of the people, it was the Taiping rebels and definitely not the uh, Qing dynasty's forces, let alone the Green Standard Army. This is a little bit ridiculous, but I get that they want Pang to seem more heroic. The two soldiers are executed in the end, which creates tension between Pang and his blood brothers. We then see Lord Yang and Lord Chen, who speak about Pang's quick rise in the military they give the impression that they cannot let Pang rise to the top and that he must be stopped. This is important as the real life figure of Ma Xinyi was indeed seen this way by Qing officials. There was an animosity and fear from the Green Standard Army towards the Yang army. Ma Xinyi was caught between all of this and we'll see later how this becomes a messy situation. 
In the next few scenes, we get to see trench warfare and life on the front lines. It's an excellent look at how the battlefield and siege looked like. Very gritty and grim and full of despair. Yet again, the lack of color really shows us the weariness and the despair of the people. Lack of food is always a common theme and really embodies the hardship of those who live through these times. Peng's forces have been sieging Suzhou for some time and they just can't seem to breach the city and they're beginning to starve. Peng goes off to beg Qing officials for provisions for his men and then is forced to make a deal with Hei Kui. He tells Hei Kui if he gives them the provisions, the army will go and attack Nanjing while the Kui army could simply stand behind, but both sides will divvy up the spoils 50-50. Basically what he's saying is that they will take Nanjing together, but Kui will basically get all of this for free. Kui accepts to give him 10 days provisions as Pang walks out and then states their army must take Nanjing before the Kui army gets there. This means that they have two days to take Zhuzhou and then eight days left to take Nanjing. Back with the men at Zhuzhou, Eryu is forced to try and meet with the Taiping commander within Zhuzhou to negotiate. Within, we see that the city is starving and is in the same misery as the forces outside. Pang comes back to the men with the provision stating that he intends to attack at dawn and is clearly not happy that Eryu went in by himself to negotiate. Pang takes this opportunity to find Liang Sheng and express his love yet again, but this time stating if Eryu dies, that he will marry her. Within Zhuzhuo, Eryu meets with the commander of the Taiping, and it turns out he was getting into this place by bringing opium to the commander, which is cute since historically the Taiping fought for a number of reasons, and one of them was to rid China of opium use. In fact, opium was, from, for, was just forbidden by the Taipings. Regardless, the Taiping commander refuses the opium, and the Taiping commander then notifies Eryu that he knows who he is and takes him hostage. Eryu says that the starving men outside will attack if he is killed, and there will be a bloodbath. So the Taiping commander then tells his men to stand down and engages Eryu in sword battle. The Taiping commander shockingly sacrifices himself for his people and jumps on Eryu's sword intentionally. Both men fall into a small water basin as the Taiping commander dies. This scene symbolizes Christian baptism. Remember, the Taiping are a quasi-Protestant movement. It is at this point Eryu forms a sort of sympathy for the Taiping cause and he promises to spare the soldiers' and civilians' lives. As Pang prepares for the assault on the city, the civilians and the Taiping soldiers lay down their arms and come out. Everyone cheers Eryu for being a great hero, and Pang smiles at him, but Eryu does not smile back. This is a starting point of friction between ideologies amongst the brothers. The 4,000 Taiping soldiers are all kept prisoners within a guarded enclosure at this point. Pang forces have provisions for only 10 days, giving them only enough time to take Nanjing before the Gui army reaches them. But if they give any provisions to the Taiping prisoners, they will run out and the Kui army will most likely catch up. Pang says they cannot give provisions to the prisoners, but Eryu begs them to do so as he did promise them food. Pang and Eryu are at odds and Pang tells Yang to give the prisoners one provision each because it will be their last meal. Eryu screams out that he promised to spare their lives. And now Pang's true conviction is shown here. As Eryu screams at Yang to stop this, Yang says that Pang is right, and Eryu is hit over the head and dragged away, chained in another room. Pang orders all the archers to execute the Taipings within the square. This is a large focal point in the film. Pang has shown how victory must be obtained at all cost for his ideal world to be made, one in which everybody should be free. This is all based on the historic event known as the Suzhou Massacre in which the Hui army led by Li Hongzhang ordered 10,000 Taiping POWs to be killed in Lohan Twin Towers in Suzhou. It is an emotional scene with the archers crying as they fire upon the Taiping prisoners and Eryu is screaming while chained up not to kill them. Yang is crying and he calls out the orders to fire as Pang is set, you know, he's seen with a single tear rolling down his face. Eryu is released and he comes to the scene of the massacre holding the corpse of a Taiping before the army buries them in a shallow grave pit. Quite a scene. Eryu screams out to the men that they should just go home now and there is a tense situation between Pang and Eryu. Pang says they cannot go home, they have to attack Nanjing and Eryu says, for what? To kill more defenseless people? 
Eryu then screams at Pang that he said everybody should be free, even the poor. Pang's rebuttal is that those men massacred were soldiers and they were prepared to die. Nanjing, however, has over a million civilians, and if the Kuei army reaches them first, they will all be killed. He begs Eryu to help take Nanjing before the Kuei army arrives so that they can save those people. If Eryu leaves, there will be a mutiny, and Pang states he will be forced to kill him. Yang screams he will protect Eryu, but that Eryu must not leave. Pang gets on his knees and he begs Eryu, saying that taking Nanjing will provide peace in the end. He also states that one day Eryu will see that the decisions made at Zhuzhou were right. Eryu agrees to go along, but he says he will be watching Pang's actions in Nanjing to see if he is indeed right, because if he is wrong, he will kill him. We get a brief and quick shot showing that Nanjing was taken, and I, I really gotta say, I was disappointed by this, honestly. The historic third battle of Nanjing is one of the most incredible battles in this entire war. There were so many different forces at play. Westerners were kind of there too. There was Western arms, there was artillery. The Taipings put on this brilliant defense, but they were just brutally massacred in the streets. It would have been like street to street combat you've never seen. And the movie just kind of glosses over it. And I think it was stock footage from them raiding other towns, to be honest, that is shown in the film. I don't know why they glossed over it. Anyways, we are now one month after the capture of Nanjing, and Eryu makes a speech demanding half the spoils of Nanjing be handed over to the soldiers. However, Pang states that it all belongs to the Qing imperial coffers. Eryu says if Pang won't give the men the spoils, he will forcing Pang into a real, really uncomfortable corner. During all of this, Pang is being made governor of Jiangzhou by the Dowager Empress Zizi. This threatens Hui Kui's position, and some Qing officials plot with He Kui to get Er Yu on their side to bring down Pang. This is all based on the real historic plot against Mao Zinyi. It's a bit complicated, but basically the Zhang army and the Green Standard army were at odds with another... And once the Taiping Rebellion was quelled, uh, Pang's promotion was, let's say, troublesome to some high officials. You see, the Zhang, Hui, and Chu armies were created in a desperate last-minute attempt to raise more troops because the Taiping rebels were honestly winning the war. The warlords who controlled these militias were a threat to the Qing dynasty once the Taiping rebels were defeated. Since Mao Zhenyi was promoted up the Green Standard Army and was given the governorship of Jiangzhou, he was a threat to the militia armies, to say the least. We then get a scene where Eryu is eating and seeing a show depicting the three Blood Brothers' achievements. He smiles and cries at this, clearly at extreme odds over Pang. Then General Kui shows up and tells Eryu to join forces with him so that they can be you know, get back at Pang for what he did. He proposes they can control Nanjing together. We then see Yang following Yan Qin through the town, spying on her, and look and behold, she is with Pang. Yang finally figures out that Pang has been having an affair with Liang Sheng this entire time. Pang is now undergoing the process of becoming governor, and he meets with the Dowager Empress Ji Xi, whom is commending him for the capture of Nanjing. Pang demands that Zhang Zhu be exempt from taxes for three years so that they can recover from the war. And man, that actually sounds pretty awesome to be exempt of taxes. Now, Pang is being told that his actions have offended Lord Jiang and He Kui, and that he has no allies. They are telling him he needs to look out for himself now, as the rebellion has been quelled. The local militias wield way too much power, and the Empress is concerned. They draw attention to Er Yu, who has threatened to desert at Zhuzhou, and doled out the funds at Nanjing that were meant just for the royal coffers. This is preceded by a symbolic scene where Pang literally is walking on ice and then says he's been doing so his entire life. We peel over to Eryu who is talking about going back home and leaving Nanjing as he hands his cross necklace back to Liancheng, which is obviously symbolic. Then suddenly he is told by a messenger that General Kui plans to assassinate Pang. Eryu desperately tries to find Pang, but Pang seems to be hiding intentionally. A messenger tells Eryu that Pang needs him in Jampu immediately. During all of this, Yang is also desperately trying to find Eryu and Pang, but he ends up finding Pang hiding. 
Yang now suspects that Pang is going to have Er Yu assassinated because of Liang Zheng. Yang tells him to wait and then just runs off quickly. Yang goes to see Liang Sheng and he tells her that he's going to kill her. He is doing so to stop Pang from killing Er Yu. We see the image of her cross as Yang holds up the dagger to her and she asks him, Is this really going to save Er Yu by killing her? He tearfully stabs her to death. In Yang's mind, uh, this is all because of the love triangle, and he simply does not see the real politique that is occurring around him. It's kind of bizarre, honestly. Uh, we see Er Yu in Jiampu alone in the rain, and he is suddenly struck with an arrow. Pang simultaneously is alone at a dinner table he set up for himself and Er Yu, symbolically, as he speaks about all of their great achievements. He's symbolically telling Eryu how he can create the perfect world now, one where everyone is free and not hungry, and that Eryu will understand why he did the thing he did one day. Eryu is straight up boromir to death in the rain, as Pang says Eryu will not die in vain. Pang discloses that it was actually the Imperial Court who wanted Eryu dead. Eryu dies calling out to his brother as Pang sheds tears and looks at the empty place in front of him full of nice, colorful, and vibrant food. Yet again, food and hunger are symbolically shown. The irony that Eryu dies now as we see amazing food meant for him to be eating, but he will never taste it. Symbolically, the perfect world that he'll never see. Yang shows up to Pang's door screaming not to go through with the assassination because Liang Shen is dead. A bitter, really bittersweet moment as Pang holds his face screaming. This is truly a Greek tragedy if you think of it. Yang now goes to Yampu where he finds the body of Eryu and he cries over his brother's death knowing he was too late to stop it all. The last scene of the film is the famous and historic event known as the assassination of Ma Xinyi. Pang is about to complete his inauguration being escorted by guards when he is suddenly stabbed by a single man. The man is Yang, and what ensues is an extravagant martial arts battle between the two. Yang keeps screaming out, a brother who harms another brother must die, which was part of their blood brother pact. Yang keeps repeating this in the face of Pang as they fight. Pang looks at the government chair just behind him, which symbolizes his perfect world before him, and he fights easily beating back Yang. However, there is more at play here than meets the eye. As we see Qing officials speaking about how Nanjing is too important and that the Dowager Empress Yi would never entrust it to an outsider, during a cannon salute in the background, an unseen assassin shoots Pang in the back from a distance as Yang simultaneously stabs into Pang with his dagger. Again, after another cannon salute, the assassin shoots Pang in the back and Yang stabs him again. This occurs for a third time in the exact same fashion. Yang then sees Pang fall over and he sees the gun wounds in his back, looking very confused. And Pang tells him to honor their pledge. Yang stabs Pang one last time, killing him, and he begins to scream out, I, Zhang Wu Yang, killed Pang Qingyun. The movie ends saying, Pang Qingyun was assassinated July the 26th, 1870 by Yang Wu Yang, whom was executed afterwards, which concludes the film. Now, the ending is done in an excellent fashion, and it really tries to sum up what is basically Chinese folklore and legend. The real Man Xinyi was indeed assassinated by a, a man named Zhang Wu Yang, whom was interrogated afterwards. Folklore, or what is better described as, you know, gossip of the time, states that Zhang Wenjiang gave three reasons for what he did. Number one, Man Xinyi was sleeping with his wife. Number two, that thugs under Man Xinyi killed his friends and he wanted revenge. And number three seems to inv involve some kind of bet they had in which uh, Man Xinyi screwed him over. Anyways, Zhang Wenjiang was executed on uh, in October 1871. But the folklore behind the assassination of Ma Xinyi goes even further than all of this. Some believe Zhang Weizhang was set up to take the fall for the Jiang military. Others say the Dowager Empress Xi Xi had Ma killed. A folklore story about Ma entering a blood brother pact with two men, one being uh, Zhang Weizhang, in which he slept with both of their wives, was claimed as well. 
The movie tries to please many of these different stories, and in my opinion, it really pulled it off quite well. I really like the cinematic touch of the bullets going into Pang's back, which were done on behalf of the Zhang army or the Dowager Empress Xi Xi, alongside the Blood Brother story embodied by Yang stabbing into him from the front. The film did this with a lot of love and care for the history and legends around its characters. The low-key symbolism of Christianity for the Taipings was also quite interesting. I feel the depiction of Christian imagery went into very dangerous territory, and the director did the best he could to at least give it some face time. The use of desaturated color and images of food, or lack thereof, really embodied the hardship of this time period. Lastly, as a Westerner, I must commend the actors, particularly Jet Li, who I'm, I've rarely seen put on such a great dramatic performance. He really he did a good job in this film. I commend him. Now, this has been my historic review of The Warlords. I really hoped you enjoyed this episode, and could you possibly see it in yourself to leave a like, comment, and possibly subscribe? Um, if people really do like these historic film reviews that I've been doing, I have a ton of other ideas. And I think that um, Western audiences in particular will be surprised by some of the Chinese films that I've come across and watched. I don't think a lot of people in the Western world have seen some of these, and it, it might be a, a really cool way to see some new things. And this has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.